Okay. Psalm 59, we're going to be looking at this last point. Point number eight, God is our defense. God is our defense. So let's have a word of prayer, and we'll look at these last few verses. Father, thank you for your goodness. Lord, I, I thank you that you're in control. Lord, you know what we need. You know our weaknesses. You know the struggles. And God, you, you're not surprised. You're, you're totally in control of all of it, and I thank you for that. Lord, I pray that you would help tonight to be profitable for each one here. And I pray you would use this time we have together to be an encouragement, use the time in your word to be a help to us or draw us closer to you as a result of this time we have. Lord, I ask for your help, but please, as I preach, Lord, <clears throat> allow your word to be taught clearly. Pray you would give me the wisdom that I need. And I ask that in some way you would glorify yourself by our time here tonight. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Psalm 59. We're going to be looking at these last four verses. Um, oh, you caught up, David, already. Thank you. Now, in these verses... I'm not going to review everything we've done so far. We're just going to go ahead and get right into these last ones. In these verses, David is assured. David is confident that God is going to deliver him. Now, just as a, as a backup and a thinking about this, we can have the same confidence. We know that regardless of what we're going through in this life, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of a verse. You tell me if you can figure this one out. Our, our sufferings, I'll, I'll give you, here's your clue word, are light. Our sufferings that we think are so heavy, they're light. But yet we know that one day there's going to be good. We know that one day these things are gone. What is the passage that talks about that? Our afflictions are very light. Getting closer. I, gave, I just gave you two words in the verse. Our afflictions are very light. It says it in the opposite order. Our light afflictions, which are but for a moment. 1 Corinthians 4. Is it first or second? Chapter 4. Second, this is one of those that's good to commit to memory. The whole chapter is an awesome, encouraging chapter. Second Corinthians 4, verse 17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things that you're seeing, but at the things... But at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Our afflictions, and, and, and this, this is just us. I mean, we think our afflictions are so heavy. David, Paul is saying here, our afflictions are light. When we compare them to what is going to be coming up in eternity, this is, we're going to look back and say this was nothing. Our light afflictions, which are but for a moment, they're short lived. They, have, they don't even hold a comparison to what's coming in glory. That's, that's Paul's point here. And that's a good point that we're looking at with this, that David's looking at. His, his, his afflictions, the thing he's, things he's going through, they're going to be a light thing because his confidence is in God. He states, because of the, he's understanding that his confidence is in God, he's, he states in his thoughts towards the enemy in verses 14 and 15, and then he's going to state his, his thoughts towards God in 16 and 17. So let's look at these. Verse 14 and, and 15. And at evening, let them return 
and let them make a noise like a dog and go round about the city. Let them wander up and down for me and grudge if they be not satisfied. Now, when I think of this, the, the, the example he's giving, and we looked at this a little bit before, but the dogs that he's talking about. When I think of dogs, you think of, think of coming home to an animal that's happy to see you. And that's what I think of. I come into the house and I have two of them just come running. And they jump and jump and jump until you touch them. And they just love to be touched. They're happy to see you. These are men, man's best friend. These are loyal companions. In the East, that's not it. In the East, when we start talking about dogs, this is more the idea for us of the coyotes. It would be the jackals. You know, I love to watch these, these shows or these video clips that show the jackals going after the prey that a lion's got. And they just gang up. The jack, they're nasty animals. That's the hyena, not the jack. I'm thinking of the hyena. The, the, but these wolves, these, an, these, these are pack animals. And what they're doing is they are looking to eat you. That's what these pack animals do. They want to kill you. And when you see an animal like that, if you see it in the wild and it just passes, you're okay. When they see you, you're in trouble, especially if they start that circular thing, okay? You know that you don't want this. And David is comment. that's what he's commenting on when he's talking about these dogs. Now, verse 14 is really a repeat if you look back up in verse six, they return at evening, they make a noise like a dog, they go round about the city. It's, it's a total repeat of that verse. The difference really is the context. When you look at verse seven and verse 15, there's the difference of these two. The enemies, they, they're still going to return. They're still going to make noise. They're still going to roam the streets. They're still coming and they're going to cause trouble but there's going to be a different attitude with these enemies. So look back up at verse seven. They belch out with their mouth. Swords are in their lips. For who they say to us here? So this attitude, if you remember, we looked at their attitude back there, and this attitude is one of arrogance. They were just cocky. They're vicious. They're ready to come in and conquer the world. They're going to tear up David. Now we get down to verse 15. Let them wander up and down from me and grudge if they be not satisfied. So here's what's happening in this verse. These animals, they're defeated. These animals, these dogs, they're going to have to wander up and down. They're trying to find something. These animals don't have much hope. When we see them wandering, here what they're doing is wandering for prey. They're hungry. They don't have anything to look for. They're, they're just, they're, they're frustrated. And it says, let them... Uh, end of verse 15, and grudge if they be not satisfied. Okay, grudge. That word, um, I don't think the, the grudge here is the way I think of it in English. It's a continual longing. It's a continual roaming. It's a complaining. He said, these guys are going to be totally frustrated. They cannot find contentment. That's what's going on in verse 15. So they go in verse 7 from cocky down to a lack of contentment, a lack of peace. Kind of reminds, reminds me, you know, of, of, of my dogs. If, if, if I get an animal when I'm hunting and I get, you know, the blood, I'm, I hope I'm not being gross to anybody, but you need to get blood on you and it's on your pants, it's on the pants leg. And my dogs will smell that. They can smell that for a long time. And those dogs will come and smell, smell, smell. And they go after this. They, they follow you. They're pace, they'll pace around for you. They just get very excited. And there's a, I'll say with the dogs, it's a discontentment. Because they're smelling something and they can't get their mouth on it. And they're not going to bite my leg. I mean, they just know I smell something. I want it. I can't have it. When I see them do, okay, with my dogs, I see that happen. I want to butcher the thing, get a rib, and give them the rib, and let them play with it just to satisfy them because they're so frustrated. Okay, with a wild dog, you obviously don't want to do that. But listen, here, that's the same picture. It's like they know something's close, and they're just frustrated. They're getting, they get all excited, 
and yet they can't have what, they're, what they want. That's the picture that David is giving here. So they wouldn't be satisfied even though they want to do this attack. So that's what we're seeing. So David, in this verse, let him wonder. Let him be like this. David has no sympathy for his enemies. He's in his, let him go. I, I don't care. He wants them frustrated. He wants them not to get, obviously, what they want, which is him. So notice the difference we have in verses 16 and 17. So here what we're going to see is they're dissatisfied, but David is extremely satisfied. There's just, there's the, the whole storyline has shifted. So here what we're going to see really is his thoughts towards God. So look at verse 16. But I will sing of thy power. Yea, I will sing aloud of thy mercy in the morning, for thou hast been my defense and refuge in the day of my trouble. Unto thee, O my strength, will I sing. For God is my defense and the God of my mercy. So what is it? The first words, what is it that David is very um, adamant that he is going to do? He's determined to do something. What is it? He's going to sing. Okay. What is, when, when people, when David in the Psalms, when he says, I'm going to sing, what does that imply that he's doing? What kind of a song would we say this is? Worship or cry out. Yeah. In this case, he's worshiping. This is a praise. He is going to say, God, you're, it's all about you. I'm so thankful for you. So David, he said, I, will, I am determined. I will. I am determined to sing of what? Power. The power of God. He is determined. And the, the word sing there, the idea is sing aloud. David is not frustrated. David, what he's showing here, he is totally content with God. Okay, now let's back up. Is David out of his hot water at this point? No. There's the, the, the battle still going on. They are still surrounding his house. They are still wanting to kill him. And David is totally confident because his, his focus is back on to his God. So when you start saying David is going to sing aloud... You got to ask, you know, why is this going to happen? The power that is against David is very strong. The power is, is, is it's an awesome power, but his thinking is this, you know, if God think, well, not his thinking, let's think about our thinking. If God doesn't care, about us. He can have all the power in the world. Does that power help us? In order for that power to make any difference, he's got to love us. He's got to care about us. That's what David is experiencing right now. Not only does he have a God of all power, he has a God, and I want to say it this way, of all love. If you don't have the two of those together, we're kind of up a creek. David understands here, yes, I've got a powerful God, but God is willing to work on my behalf. That's where mercy comes in. God is showing this mercy for me. I'm going to sing of thy power, yea, I'm going to sing aloud of thy mercy in the morning. You need both, his power and his love, and that is exactly what David is experiencing. As you and I start to understand this concept that we have a God who not only loves us, but has the power to do something about this, our, our issues, we can be singing aloud. We need to think on this. We need to understand that both of these are needed. So without the power, God can't protect us. Without the mercy, he won't protect us. We've got to have both of these and understand that God is giving us both of these. And that's a blessing for us. Okay, I will sing of thy power. Yea, I will sing aloud of thy mercy in the morning. In the morning. There's another verse. Look, look, keep your place there. Just turn back a few pages to Psalm 30. 
Psalm 30 and verse 5. Psalm 30, verse 5, his anger endures but a moment. In his, in his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Same phrasing. Things may be going in a way we don't like. Weeping may endure for the night. It may endure for a while, but joy is going to come in the morning. It's coming. We can trust that, you know, even if this whole life is rough, Joy is coming in the morning. When we get to see our Lord, that joy, and that joy is not, let me rephrase that. The relief of the pressure is definitely going to come when we escape this world. We can, can we have still the joy here and now, even when things are rough? Yeah, we can. For us, we know one of, the, one of the main fruits of the Spirit, joy. As we are trusting in our God, despite what we're going through, we can still have that joy based in Him, based on what He has done, based on what He is doing, and based on what we know is coming. Based on our relationship with Him, we can have this joy. There's a few words I'm going to go through on this, but is there any questions, comments, as far as the joy that we can still have? Joy comes in the morning. Even on any of the verses stuff we've looked at so far, sing of his power, sing aloud of his mercy. Okay. So this week they may endure for a night. Joy comes in the morning. God's mercy has been shown by God. And here's what he's saying about it. God has been, first of all, second part of verse 16, Far, here's how I've seen this power, this mercy. God has been my defense. Okay, that's the word we have, that uh, the lofty place. God has been where the, he's, he's been placed, David, where the enemy can't reach him. And this verse, the, the same thing gets repeated in verse 17. <laughs> the next thing we see, he's, he's been my defense. He's been a refuge a refuge, a retreat, a place where David can flee through in that day of trouble. Unto thee, O oh my strength. That word has the idea of his being a boldness, a power, a might. This is the same word. Unto thee, O oh my strength, is the same word from verse 16. I will sing of thy power. That's the same word as my strength. Unto thee, O my strength, will I sing, for God is my defense, again repeated from verse 16, and the God of my mercy. So he repeats this, this whole concept two different times. He keeps repeating these words. God has clearly demonstrated his loving kindness for David, and David is just emphasizing these things, and he's thankful for this. Okay, that's David's life. Now let's bring it forward a little ways to Jesus' life. How do we see these concepts? The enemies are coming. They're frustrated. They, in this case, Jesus was not. He's understanding the power, the loving kindness of his father. How do we see this in Jesus' life? He just, he's in prayer. He needs prayer from time to time where, you know, he was reliant on the father. The old of God man, he was still reliant on the Father for strength. And just, he had to go cry out and to pray and, Lord, give me strength so that I won't stumble. And so you can kind of see that correlation there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Another one. There's a number of them in here, so they don't, there's not just one right answer. How else do we see this in Jesus' life? Go from the enemy's side. We see a similarity of what was happening with the enemies of Jesus, with what was happening here with the enemies of David. Yes. Jesus forgave them. Just like David said, slay them not. They have a little bit different attitude on that one, but uh, definitely forgive them. They know not what they do. 
Did Jesus have a lot, or did Jesus' enemies experience frustration as they were chasing after Jesus? Yeah, they couldn't get him to fall or break. I mean, he was just to the T with what the good book said that he was going to be, you know? Exactly. He never detoured, never sinned. He was perfect. They kept trying to trip him up, and they couldn't do anything until Jesus said, okay. Now I'll let you. It was in his control. But they were, there was a lot of frustration. I mean, at the very end, they thought they had it. They thought they had done their job. Was there frustration right afterwards? Better believe it. They couldn't find the body. There's a major frustration. His enemies, is like they were panting for that blood. They were waiting to go attack something, and then they were just getting frustrated. His, whole, his enemies were totally discontent. Just like these dogs that had lost their meat, so to speak. That's what they were doing. Think about the disciples, too, that were trying to defend Jesus at times. Where Jesus was just like, stop, you know. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen, and let it happen. Yes. Was Jesus worried about them? About them getting him? Was he, was he stressing because these enemies are going to come and they're, they might win? No. I mean, again, just like David, let them wander up and down. Let them do what they want to do. They can't do anything to me. And he knew it. He was totally confident. What else? Anything else we see? Similarities. One that I would notice or point out was is that just as David is in his struggles and he's having peace, that is happening because he is in fellowship with the Father. David was in fellowship with God at this point. David's confidence was there, and again, just like Jesus. I mean, David knew he was going to dwell with, with, with God at some point. He knew that he would go there. Jesus was totally confident in his father's protection, in his father's love. Jesus had no reason to be anxious, if you will. The only thing that he didn't want was that separation from the father. Okay, let's bring this one back to us. Are there some applications that you and I can make from these verses? I've got, I've got two quick ones listed and we can go further, but you give me one. How can we look at this? Yes. Pete. Oh, uh, I think sometimes we, we have this false dichotomy that we think if we're trusting God, we're not going to be afraid. And if we're afraid, we're not trusting God. And I think uh, what David exemplifies here, uh, and I think, you know, similar to what Jesus, Jesus expressed great sorrow and, and, you know, anxiety about what was going to happen at the cross. But yet he was trusting God, right? We know that Jesus did not fail in his trust in God, but yet he could say things like, if this, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me, right? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So I think I think it's natural for us to experience fear, and we're never going to be free of that. We shouldn't be seeking to be free of fear in the sense of um in, in the sense of what we see here. I mean. God created us to be dependent and to seek refuge in Him. We can't trick ourselves into saying, "Well, this isn't a problem. Or this isn't this isn't something we need to worry about." Um, rather, it's, it's who we go to when we're afraid. So, you know, I think in this life, we're never going to be free of fear. It's just we have something that's stronger than than those things that we fear, and that is our defense to God. So, they they can work together here. Fear drives us to God and find security in Him, but not an absence of those of the troubles of life. Mm -hmm. You could probably throw some other words into that. Things that we won't be free from. Like fear is a, is a key one. Doubt. Anxiousness. We're going to experience these things. And probably a lot more often than we like to admit they're there. I mean, it's, we're weak. Well, I'm weak. I can't speak for you. I, you know, it, it's a reality. Excellent point. 
What else? These are good. Let's look back and take a negative example. You've got the enemies, and obviously we don't want to be lined up with the enemies of Jesus. We don't want to be lined up with Saul's men and the enemies of, of David. But let's look at that for a second because here's what they were doing. These, these people are longing for ungodly things. They are wanting what is not biblical. They're wanting something that they shouldn't be longing for. And I'm just going to suggest for us today, as we are longing for ungodly things, as we're longing to get the things of this world to have our satisfaction, we are not going to be content. We're going to be totally discontent. We will be like discontent. I stopped my word. I'm sorry. We're going to be like these that wander up and down and they're just grudging. They can't be satisfied. When we're longing for the wrong things, you won't find contentment. They won't satisfy you, especially when, when you've got, and, and this is unfortunate, when you've got people who are saying, you know, I have entered a relationship with Jesus, but, I'm, but we're, we're deceiving ourselves and we're going after things that can't satisfy. We're going to be discontented. We're going to be careful. We're not falling into that, that trap, if you will, there, there's just going to be a constant lacking. And usually, I will say for us, you know, our problem isn't so much, you know, sometimes we, we complain that we don't have enough. Our problem usually isn't poverty. Our problem is discontentment. That's what most everybody I talk to who says, you know, I just don't have enough of what I'm looking for. It's discontentment. It's not the poverty level. We should not be content. We should not be content when Jesus is not our focus. If it's for anything else, there should be a discontent. Jesus is where we're going to get our contentment and our relationship with him. Does that make sense? That's just one. Yes. Oh, doesn't it? Say that last part. If we need those from the world, it's not going to it is is that gra the gradual sanctification process it doesn't happen overnight you're absolutely right it's a slow process okay there's two of them anybody else I've got another How does this apply to us? What is something we can pull away, especially from these, and apply in our own lives? I just, I'm looking at God as my defense. God, if, if God is for us, who can be against us? Mentality, you know, is our sword and shield. And put on the floor and let God and we go out in the world. Absolutely. God is our defense. And it, it, I was just thinking with that, you know, he sets us up high where the archers can't shoot at us. So when we get hit, it's not because God isn't our defense, it's because we've jumped out of his, out from him. We're, we're you know, we're exposing ourselves. We're not trusting him. We're not following him. He's, he provides that defense. Absolutely. He is faithful. His mercies are new every morning. We can trust him in this. I appreciated the, the fact that David, as he's getting his focus back on God, as he, he said, I will sing of the power of God. Yea, I'm going to sing aloud of the mercy of God. When we think on, when we meditate on God's power that's been demonstrated for us, I'm thinking primarily you know, for us, the cross, when we think on what he has done, we think on the gospel, it is going to result in us singing praises to God. You may not walk around singing. I, uh, I would think, you know, I've heard, <laughs> I think I've shared this before. I remember going into this, this, I think it was the Snits one time, and I walked in to get something to eat, and these guys come around to this table and they tell this other guy, hey, come on, come on, we're doing something back on the bar side. 
and they walk back around and you hear these people singing so foolishly. They are being wacko. But you know what? They're as happy as they can be. Something's going on and they're happy. And what do they do? They sing. What do people do at a game when their team wins? They sing their, their song, their school song or whatever it is. So often we see people, they sing when they're excited about something. You know what? When we get excited about God, it should result in us singing. He'll put a new song in us. He will put that joy in us. It will often be expressed through singing praises to God. And I would encourage us. He's going to sing of the power of God. He's going to sing of the mercies of God. What we need to do is intentionally, okay, get that word in your mind, because this doesn't happen all the time natural. We need to intentionally rehearse, regularly rehearse all that our Lord has done for us. Everything we can remember, rehearse it through our minds. Yeah, God went to that cross for me. He took my punishment, even when he saw, like we looked at this morning, even as he saw that I was bringing nothing but my filth to the table, he loved me. And he put his robes of righteousness on me in place of my filthy sin. He gave me his righteousness. He did that for us. And even knowing that after he gave us this tremendous gift, we were going to go back and sin more against him. He still loved us. Our God has just shown us mercy after mercy after mercy, and we should be thinking all this and praising him for what he's done. It was nothing that we did to earn this. We've just got an awesome God. And when we think on this, it will generate praise, whether it be by singing, whether it be by telling others about it, it's going to generate praise, and our Lord deserves this. He is the one that deserves the praise, not us. So we should be doing this. And David is doing an excellent job at that. He's declaring, I'm going to sing to my God. I'm going to sing praise aloud to him. So our application statement. True contentment comes only from a proper understanding and relationship with Jesus. When we dwell on him, praise will be the natural outcome. That is Psalm 59. You've been very patient as we went through this psalm. Um, Any questions, comments? What's that? (laughs) Psalm 60. Okay. We will hit it. And, you know, I I, I pray for that one. I've gone through verse 3. Uh, those are ready. Uh, I've got a lot of work to do and very little time to do it in. So uh, we'll see. We may take a little bit of a break before we hit Psalm 60. Um, One of my goals is to use things that we're getting for while I'm gone to bring back and have the pictures and show you hopefully context. And I want to be able to use this and show you. So that's my goal. Uh, I told, I told somebody just a while back, I am not a creative person, uh, and I get it, so. Do you have the camera you're going to be taking? I do. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I am not a creative person. I am not one that comes up with ideas of, yeah, I could do it this way and present it this way. I just kind of look and say, let's try it. And, but I'm not your creative person. Pray that God gives me some creativity. Uh, he can do this. So we'll see how that goes. I appreciate your prayers for that. Anyone else before we close? All right, let's close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your goodness. Lord, I thank you for being a gracious God. Lord, help us to trust you. Help us to think on you and to praise you. God, give us a a desire to consciously bring back into our minds and to meditate on what you've done for us and on who you are. Lord, give us a passion for you. I pray you would help us as we go out this week. Lord, use us in some way to bring glory to you. 
Use us to further your kingdom. Give us, Lord, a heartbeat to follow you. Just thank you, God, for all you've done. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.